Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for regrouping um, and to do, doing so in such a timely fashion so we can continue the conversation. Our next panel, um, what is the site in site-specific art, is uh, it, meant to provoke a, a question around scale, how, how wide, uh, how expansive do we understand a site to be when we work there, uh, as well as issues around equity, as well as uh, issues around what happens when the material and social dimensions of the site become, again, not just simply inert background for artwork, but animate part of the foreground and the very center of what an art project is exploring. Uh, so we're hoping to get uh, inside the techniques of particular artists working in this mode. Uh, and I'm going to let my colleague, Susan Schweik, introduce the panel. I'm so pleased that Susan agreed to join us today. Susan uh, wears so many hats on this campus. She's an associate dean of the arts and humanities. She's head of varieties of projects related to um, our, our uh, uh, Mellon postdoc, all of our Mellon postdocs, as well as the key uh, uh, force behind uh, our disability studies clusters on campus, both at the research level for the faculty and at the curricular level for our students. Uh, her most recent book is uh, The Ugly Laws, Disability in Public, Mining Past Municipal Laws that Criminalized Disability and Unsightliness um, in Public Spaces. Uh, and that kind of uh, uh, awareness around um, the visual culture of cities and issues of equity um, and access are very much animate. I know the perspective she'll bring to this panel and this gathering today. Susan. Thank you. I can't believe how fun this is and how lucky I am to be here today. It just feels like this amazing uh, gift. Um, I'm going to start out just by telling you a little bit about the panelists. It was thrilling to imagine them gathering together and then um, just say a very few words. So our speakers are going to be uh, first Raquel Gutierrez, uh, who uh, works at, the, manages the I Community in Community program at uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. She's originally from LA. She's an artist and writer and community organizer. And she said I should say she's really good at community partnership. And I already um, have that sense. Um, then we'll hear from Ava Roy and Lauren Dietrich Chavez um, from We Players. Ava Roy founded We Players in 2000 and um, served both as uh, the director and producer and as a performer. Um, and I don't know how many of you have been to these productions, but um, they're quite spectacular. So they involve all these unique partnerships with the National Park Service and the California State Park System and very large-scale performances at park sites. Um, Lauren Dietrich Chavez is a civil and environmental engineer turned managing director of We Players. And uh, she uh, said to say that she focuses her efforts on community outreach, aesthetic education, and partnership development in addition, in addition to just managing this large-scale traveling theater. Which I can't even imagine that job, actually. Uh, and then finally, our respondent discussant is uh, Rebecca Novick from uh, the Triangle Lab um, and uh, the joint project between uh, Intersection, which we've already heard from, Intersection of the Arts and California Shakespeare Theater. Um, and uh, I hope she'll be talking more about Triangle Lab. Uh, she's the founding artistic director also of Crowded Fire. So this is an incredible uh, group of people who brought so much incredible theater uh, to the Bay Area at many sites. When I uh, was asked to uh, introduce them, I went and read the blogs. And I don't know how many of you have gone through and read all the blogs. Or it's, um, you have to go to the ARC site to find some of them. Uh, and the blogs that are written by the people on this panel are, are astonishing, I thought. And uh, a few of the lines that are just resonating me from them, um, first of all, from Rebecca Novick's words describing um, the incredible project um, which goes to different sites where people have been shot in the East Bay and starts with the line, that's not my BART stop. 
um, describing this love bomb for my spirit child project at Fruitvale Station. And if you haven't read that blog entry, if you've seen that the movie or if you haven't, go, go read it. Um, from Ava Royce, the, the uh, wonderful last line, the sun takes a bow, describing what happens uh, to the sun during Macbeth uh, at the site of Fort Point. And Raquel Gutierrez, I think, posed the challenge for us in her blog post, uh, meditating on the, the, the word in the title, site-specific, and proposing an alternative, which I'm sure she's going to talk about, site-responsive, um, and focusing on that difference. And this is a quotation from her. So I suggest we instead think about making site-responsive community-led arts collaborations that give way to transforming the current arts institutional landscape. Respond as artists, sure, but as institutions, more importantly, to what's happening on the ground, in the trenches, with people that are living with the specter of change daily. So here we are, uh, all of you from being on the ground and in the trenches, and. Um, in the sun and the, the light and the wind in, uh, in this institutional site, UC Berkeley, and in this exact place. And I have to say that um, reading those blogs and already what happened this morning is um, making me feel very responsive to this site. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Raquel. Hi, everyone. I'm going to read off my laptop. Um, you know, when I uh, begin an encounter with community, I do a series of different um, cultural mapping exercises to get a sense of who's in the room. So um, just because you're facing this way and I'm facing that way and there's no that way facing, I'm just going to ask a few questions. And you, if you can just raise your hand high so everyone can see so we could all get a sense of who's in the room, please, and thank you. All right, all the undergraduate students, please raise your hands. Oh, I guess they were just here for lunch because I was talking to <laughs> six of them. We're having a really great conversation. They were in Amanda Eicher's class, so I guess maybe that class is over and they're back. Um, OK. Uh, all the graduate students, please raise your hands high. High. That's right. Look around. Look around. OK. All the um, uh, assistant professors, raise your hands high. All right. All the associate professors, raise your hand. All right. All the professor, full professors, raise your hands. Fantastic. OK. All the, um, if you're an artist administrator, entry level, raise your hand. That's right. You raise it right. You raise it. Uh, if you're a mid manager in an arts administration, please raise your hand. Fantastic. Look around, look around. Uh, executive staff. Executive uh, directors of arts organizations, please raise your hand. High and high and high. All right, look around, look around. Fantastic. Okay, and then we're gonna do one more, um, real quick. Just uh, how many people? It, how long did it take you? If raise your hand if it took you 30 minutes to get here. 30 minutes or less. Yeah, 30 minutes or less. Okay, look around, look around. Raise your hand if it took you 30 minutes or more. 30 to 60 minutes. All right, cool. Cool. So this is who's in your room right now. All righty. Uh, I'm no. Uh -uh. Um. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. So the uh, keyword reflection. I wrote 532 words that you saw on the Arc Director's blog spot, um, and it inspired me to, to write a longer essay. This is equal parts personal biography, and it kind of goes into a larger sort of like professional biography, and I'm also from Los Angeles, so bear with me. Baz Luhrmann once said that you should live in New York City once, but leave before it makes you hard. Live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you soft. <laughs> Los Angeles made me too hard to enjoy living in New York when I was there for grad school, and I've always wanted to live in San Francisco, but I was already too soft. 1995, I was 19 the first time, and already it felt too late. I had come to visit my friend Adam who had moved up to the city, living with three other artists in a large railroad flat on the corner of Hayes and Fillmore. 
He was trying to explain what he did at the organic food co-op in Noe Valley, but I just looked eastward from his living room window at the magic hour, sulking over my inability to kickstart adulthood back in Los Angeles, wondering if maybe I should make a leap northward, northward to the city by the bay. But San Francisco was a place for dreamers, and I didn't yet trust mine. However, almost 20 years later from that first trip, I made it. I managed to obtain a decent paying job in the arts, even though it felt ridiculous to move to the most expensive city in the country. In Los Angeles, I could be a working artist or someone who works in the arts and makes art too, with cheap rents and enough space to move around. I am low income by San Francisco standards, even as the bulk of my work is focused on reaching out to low income communities of color. I cannot help but wonder if and when I leave here, it will be because living became too hard. San Francisco has eclipsed New York in those ways that make people hard. Eviction rates that are off the scales and the concomitant anxieties that burden working class families or overeducated public sector workers struggling to pay off student debt with no relief in sight makes us hard. The Mission District is a different and costlier beast that reminds me of Silver Lake circa 2004 when it was a Los Angeles barrio that was home to Cuban immigrants fleeing Fidel Castro's reign and Salvadoran and Guatemalan immigrants fleeing Ronald Reagan's, but soon became the new hot hood to move to when Santa Monica and Venice became too expensive for regular old Hollywood industry workers, mostly production types working 16 hour shoots. But Los Angeles is what Rainer Banham calls a uniquely mobile metropolis, over time shifting in scale to accommodate the autom automobile. This is why LA has those beautifully dystopic creatures known only as the 405 and the East LA Interchange. But arriving in San Francisco, I am reminded that this city in large part is designed to the scale of the hum average human being with humane commuting strategies that put Los Angeles to shame. But what makes the space here different is that, it, that there's less of it. Space that accommodates a multiplicity of households has already been spoken for, but that doesn't stop a rightfully entitled newly moneyed class from coming in and taking it. It makes an object like the Google bus an easy receptacle to fill with collective fear and loathing. Never mind the fact that our lives are that much better because Google exists. It's hard to get my community partners to admit this. Perhaps they can just quietly email me from their Gmail accounts. But no one has to know how much you, you, know, you or they or all of us enjoyed playing the Moog when Google honored Bob Moog's 78th birthday last year. Wasn't that awesome? Um, and uh, I'm from Los Angeles, and I love the Dodgers, but I can never fully ever enjoy a Dodgers game because the ghosts of Chavez Ravine will never stop haunting them. And I feel like I... Um, had this conversation with a friend who's just like, well, you know, don't like them too much because they're playing on stolen land. But at the end of the day, we all are. You know, people will be forced out in the cities they live in. They pay taxes in the cities that have made these social contracts to take and educate our children. They help us when our homes burn down. They heal us when we are hurt. They will always be the first to betray. If you've lived it, you call it gentrification or aburga, aburguesamiento. Aburguesamiento. That is gentrification in Spanish. If you talk about it from a detached perspective, or if you're in a planning department, you probably refer to it as displacement. Me, I am an interloper, first and foremost, and especially when it comes to Bay Area arts and cultural organizing. It's good to be aware of that before setting out to do community engagement for a large art center located in one of the most fraught neighborhoods in downtown San Francisco. I arrive with open hands to greet the closed fists of folks in the south of market neighborhood known as Soma who are tired weary of new people, though they are way too friendly to show it. They are Filipino youth, veterans of wars and military actions in Vietnam and Kuwait, chess lovers. But by approaching an organization such as SOMCAN, I sit with community organizers at the South of Market Community Action Network and learn. And with this in mind, I start slow with the range of communications, email, phone calls, in-person meetings, a lot of coffees, lunches, and dinners on my company's dime. I have to make it worth communities while to spend time with me, a stranger. I sit, I listen, 
I learned a range of economic, educational, health, and artistic community histories. I sit, I listen, I hear the stories of loss, and in that tender wreckage, there are moments of triumph, resilience. I sit, I listen, I ask if there are volunteer opportunities or public events, fundraisers, political actions. These are opportunities for the artists we vet to put their hands in the soil. These are opportunities for our organizations to nurture our inner empath to see what are the trials and tribulations a community collectively faces. Because most times, we as mid-level managers and entry-level program assistants are part of those communities, struggling to make ends meet on top of student loan debt with our nonprofit salaries and lack of trust funds. We work these uncertain career tracks because we love art and community and want to find ways to break open all avenues of accessibility. We want to work with artists like Harry Leelam Love, born in Oakland, raised in the Montclair district of mixed race heritage and a resident of West Oakland now since 2005, who is interested in learning about where West Oakland residents go when they can no longer afford to live in their community or willingly and happily sell these, their, new home, their homes to new incoming creative class of buyers. Her Oakland and Exile project charts these changes alongside the ways that West Oakland has lost men and women and youth to the prison industrial complex because we are on the verge of losing youth's voices in the same way we lose elders to death. We lose them to displacement. We lose them to the prison industrial complex and the scarcity mindset that kicks in produces a discourse of mine slash territoriality, which to me feels similar to the Minutemen stalking men, women and children in the US Mexico desert. Don't come here, this is mine. People turn other people into suspects. In my new Mission Terrace neighborhood, my neighbor keeps throwing eggs at my car because I park in front of his house. And I don't get mad because I am hyper aware that this manifestation of impotence is a byproduct of the anxious times we're living in. So how do you facilitate art making with a community specific agenda when community is in the middle of meeting changes? And if you've read my blog piece, you will have known what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I posit that site specificity has to be questioned as sites become contested. Specificity, I dare say, lacks the efficacy, efficacy it once had when social practice enabled a purview contingent on a radical condition of possibility. And now these conditions placed upon sites where communities we're interested in partnering with are radical in totally frightening ways that affect individuals whose perspectives can enrich the way we think about the arts. So I suggest we think about making site responsive community led collaborations that give way to transforming current arts institutional landscapes. Respond as artists, sure, but as institutions, more importantly, to what is happening on the ground, in the trenches, with people that are living with the specter of change daily. Otherwise, we lose. Aside from the last generation of engaged patrons, not just the kind that stay late for post-show Q&As, but that weigh in on the creation of such works to begin with, we risk losing a generation of youth leaders and possibly enter a period of obsolescence. Because if you don't like change, you're going to like obsolescence less. Um, YBCA and community... That's the, community, that's the name of the program I manage, YBCA and Community, is a pilot community collaboration program with objectives to create community-relevant, hierarchy-free art through mutually beneficial relationships between the YBCA institution, professional artists, and local community organizations and their membership base. We're trying to develop an innovative new framework for accessible arts engagement, one that convenes low-income, ethnically diverse, and uh, if you look at the LIED, it's like LIED, LIED2 communities, we like to call them, um, underserved community members, partner community organizations, and individual artists to collaborate in experiential art making. YBC and community, we've identified four neighborhoods. I just lost my place. Um, as project sites, containing six projects total with over 12 community partners over the course of 12 months. The four communities, the four neighborhoods, Soma, South of Market, Mission and the Excelsior, and West Oakland. Now these were selected by curators of YBCA. These have long-standing communities of color, multiple ongoing histories of displacement, and there is a uh, urgent need to capture these stories and facilitate venues and ways to bring attention to, to the plight issues, the realities that these communities face, but also as a way to create multiple sites of dialogue, as well as finding ways for our institution to be transformed by their input. Um, how much time do I have? Am I good? Okay. Um, YBCA, we aim to immerse YBCA into the fabric of local communities through a new 
testing as we go framework for accessible arts engagement, but being aware that of the institutional community tensions and healthy skepticisms that work with and against us in launching this institutionally paradigmatic shifting initiative. Along the way, we've invited scholars and activists to critically witness and engage with the tensions and healthy skepticisms that emerge in this type of collaboration, to document and analyze, analyze where we can improve as we ask and find answers for these kinds of questions. What does it mean to do site responsive versus site specific art? How do we negotiate the power dynamics between institution, artists, and community partners? What are the roles each of us assumes when participating in a socially engaged art practice? I'm gonna talk about um, the SOMA project. Soma, um, we have a lead artist. I don't have any photos. Um, I don't want to show you photos of the artists engaging with community members um, on, the, on there for this conference. It feels weird. Um, but if you follow me on Twitter, I'll upload them. And you can check it out there. Um, Eliza Barrios, she's a video installation artist. Um, totally technology oriented and um, very much open about how, for her, art is, a, is about um, dialogue and a collaboration. She's not a, she, doesn't, she's not, she doesn't draw. She uh, is not a traditional fine artist. Um, and that was a way for her to connect with the youth that we've been meeting with at South Market Community Action Network because a lot of people think that they have to look, know how to draw, that they have to know how to move, that they have to have a certain level of virtuosity in order to be an artist. And um, I think it was really important for this group of youth to have this encounter with Eliza, who, you know, 20 years of being an artist has proven that you don't actually have to know how to do the five positions or whatever um, in ballet, no offense. Um, but uh, community partners have include uh, are South Market, Samkan, Bayani Han Cultural Center, Manila Heritage Foundation, Bindle Stiff Studio, and Cool Arts. Um, you've seen the alley in the the Mina Alley behind the San Francisco Chronicle Building, um, where Intersection for the Arts is located. Feeling that, that might be a viable space to create a night market, um, where Eliza can project uh, her. Her, her videos of um, basically also partnering with the Veterans Equity Center uh, to show stories of you know men, women, a generation who are either um, Korea, w Korean War, Vietnam, veterans, and the fact that, yeah, sure, we need those stories because we're gonna lose those stories to natural causes, right? To death, to the fact that men and women get, o get older. But placing that, structure and conversation with youth who we're gonna lose those stories out of SOMA because youth are being displaced um, just by the development issues in, in that neighborhood. Um, anyway, all that to say that uh, these programs are year long, uh, 12, 12 months typically, there's uh, six of them, they're staggered. Uh, we have two projects in the mission. One is uh, with um, two artists who are working in tandem, Dave End and Sandra Ibarra, performance artists, working in collaboration with Ella for Trans Latinas, located in the Redstone Building on 16th and South Venice. Ella for Trans Latinas, basically um, a support group, citizenship, um, and people who don't have citizenship for uh, Latino, Latin American immigrants who are gender non-conforming trans women. Um, I don't know how well you are in your gender theory, but we're at Berkeley. Um, and to create a, a work around this idea of uh, skill sharing, right? What would a skill for a, a monolingual trans Latina immigrant be? Well, in the conversations that they're having, you know, putting on makeup on the bus is a skill, right? Anyway, um, all that to say that I'm very excited for the conversation, and uh, thank you so much. Um, okay, thanks, bye.
That's Elena Claire, the weest we player, crying. So I think that Lauren, who's going to speak with me, is probably with her daughter right there. So at some point, Lauren will join me. But uh, hello, my name is Ava. I'm the founding artistic director of We Players, and here she comes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, we players, I'll just uh, rattle off our mission to you and then uh, go from there. But uh, we present performance events that transform public spaces into realms of participatory theater. We bring communities together, reclaiming local spaces for public discourse and civic celebration through art. Extending the transformative powers of performance beyond the stage, we invite our collaborators and audience to engage fully and awaken to the spectacular world around us. And like Raquel, I've become increasingly dissatisfied with the term site-specific or feel like it's not uh, quite, f uh, quite it's nuanced enough for what I've um, realized we are doing. So we've sort of shifted towards uh, talking about site-integrated art um, because for we players, when we uh, arrive in a new space, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of time spent researching the history, the environment, um, the themes kind of embedded in the space, the stories, the histories that have happened there. Um, there's a lot of time watching the natural environment, literally just sitting in the place and different times of day, different times of year, observing the weather, observing nat natural traffic patterns, whether those are patterns of birds or patterns of humans, um, and uh, really investing in learning about that space to then choose the story, the play, that is going to kind of best match the energy and environment of that location so that ultimately when the show is developed that the two mutually support each other. So there's a little bit of a difference between just kind of finding a cool, a cool place to do a cool show and really finding um, the right match, the right marriage between the story and the environment so that the two can mutually uh, benefit and enhance each other. And I'll draw that out a little bit more as I show you some, some of the slides, which um, uh, I'll, get, I'll get to very shortly here. Um, so just briefly, uh, the inception of this company actually started when I was a freshman at, at Stanford University down on the peninsula. And uh, I grew up in a very small town in Western Massachusetts, um, which really comes alive in the summer. It's a kind of a cultural mecca of, of art in the summertime with Tanglewood, which is the summer home of the Boston Symphony and Shakespeare and Company, which is kind of the East Coast version of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and on and on and on. Um, but in the, uh, in the winter, there's about 1,500 people and 60 kids in my graduating class. And so it's a very small kind of rural environment. So when I got to Stanford, having never been to California or visited the campus, um, you know, frankly, it felt like this kind of really bizarre uh, country club that I didn't have the sort of secret access pass to and didn't really know how to relate to the environment. So my first um, I thought was, well, great, I quit. And I'll go to Europe and travel around and see other people's art. And, uh, and then there was a really important shift that happened, which was really just very personal. Um, which was that, um, you know, I suddenly realized, oh, instead of feeling like I'm shut out from this because uh, I come from a different background, um, what if this is my playground? And what if I just start treating it that way? And so if this really uh, immaculate campus, which people come to as tourists, and there's like a long waiting list to get your, uh, get to get your wedding to get married at Stanford. Um, what if this actually becomes the stage and we start throwing banners off the clock tower and tying bodies to the sculptures and uh, using this a dramatic environment as the stage? Um, so that's really how it began, was really for me to build a personal relationship with that space. If there was any chance of me surviving four years there, how was I going to make it my home and make it a place that, uh, that fed me and that I could relate to? Um, so that's really kind of how this began, but it also very quickly became a social experiment. What would happen if Romeo and Juliet are getting married in the middle of the quad and you're on your way to class? Would you avoid it? Would you be annoyed by it? Would you drop what you were doing and join the parade? What, what would happen? And so um, largely, um, uh, there was this kind of question. Everyone I found at Stanford was sort of doing whatever they do really, really well, and that was really inspiring impressive and impressive. But in order to do that one thing really well, there's this kind of uh, this kind of thing. And so it started um, wondering, well, what would happen if we stage things in a way where things are happening above you, behind you, below you, in the distance, and uh, surprising moments of beauty in unexpected places. So you're just on your way to get lunch in the quad, and suddenly there's a brawl that breaks out. But there's something weird about it because they're biting their thumb at each other instead of flipping each other off. And there's this kind of heightened language of, of Shakespearean verse. And so at once, it's very vital and immediate, like as if we broke out into a fight right now. Uh, but it's also heightened in the realm of, of poetry. So we found very quickly that the response 
response to these questions was really powerful, that people were dropping what they were doing and joining the parade. We started the first show, uh, and maybe 60 friends of mine knew it was going to happen and were in the right place at the right time. By the end of the show, the audience had literally doubled because people just dropped what they were doing and, and followed the parade. And I should say that the shows are mobile, so you're on your feet and you're following the shows. It moves throughout the location, so you're, you're actually physically traveling, and that's the most basic level of participation. Um, that's actually how I got hooked in with Lauren, who will uh, speak more about our partnership with the National Park Service in a few minutes. Um, but Lauren actually stumbled across that first performance and just keyed in and heard, oh, I think that's the prince speaking from, from Romeo and Juliet. And she was one of those people who just kind of joined the parade. And then, um, and then we became friends and we started working together. So, um, so that's great. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll just give you a few images to give you some context. Lauren, feel free to, to chime in if there's anything I, uh, that these slides stimulate that um, I don't get to. But um, so basically, I started the, the company in, in 1999 as a 19-year-old freshman, and it's obviously grown since then. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, production 2010 and uh, not show you some of the early years when it was... <laughs> Pretty ragtag, but um, uh, but everything has to start from somewhere. So uh, we did this production in 2008 of Macbeth at Fort Point, which is a Civil War fortress under the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, and that was my first time partnering with the National Park Service, um, and that um, led to an invitation to work out on Alcatraz Island. Uh, we players were the first theater artists in residence in history on Alcatraz Island from 2009 to 2011. We did a whole series of projects out there. Um, hopefully, Lauren can speak a little bit more to some of the. Um, visual arts um, and outreach work and work that we've done with organizations who work with incarcerated populations um, and uh, children of incarcerated uh, parents uh, and artists who are incarcerated. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the theater pieces. Um, so in 2010, we did an island-wide production of, of Hamlet. This is a scene from, from Hamlet. Um, and one of the things that's really powerful, as I mentioned before, choosing the right play for the right space is that they mutually enhance each other. So when Hamlet is talking about Denmark's a prison, then is all the world one, and uh, being confined within the nutshell of his, of his own, uh, so, oh, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Um, he's got this backdrop of the prison, um, and so he doesn't need to gesticulate wildly, You're like, get it, get it, uh, you, you, you get it, or you um, can, can begin to get those more, those deeper layers of what Alcatraz might mean besides the Al Capone story when you have uh, Hamlet's musing of what it is to be and what it is to um, uh, uh, navigate the sort of filial and social and moral obligations of, of his situation. Um, to give you a little bit more specifics about how the shows work, you're on your feet, you follow the show, this is the audience chasing Hamlet up the hill as he's chasing his father's ghost. So you're right there next to the actors. And so the most basic level of participation is you physically have to move to follow the show as it moves throughout the environment. Uh, the next layer is that you can choose and change your perspective. So if you're someone who's really gung-ho and you want to be right next to Hamlet, like most eight to 10-year-old kids who come and see the shows, um, you are right next to Hamlet the whole time. Um, if you want to get a broader perspective and step back, um, you can do that as well. So you also begin to realize that you get to, that seeing is not just something that happens to you, seeing is an act of creation. And uh, in these shows, we try to uh, provide the really rich conditions for that, uh, for cultivating that skill of looking in the distance above you, behind you, below you, getting up close, choosing and changing your perspective with the hopes that this actually might make us more uh, adept and deft at doing this in our, in our daily lives. Um, seeing as, a, as an act of creation. So the ghost that he's, he's following, this costume allowed us to have six different actors playing the ghost, so we could actually achieve that sense of the ghost literally appearing and disappearing. So you actually um, walk close to oh, half a mile um, from the first sighting of the ghost to the, to the final sighting, because with uh, this uh, conceit, we're able to stage a ghost on the top of the cell house, now on the top of the guard tower, et cetera. Gives you a little bit of a sense of our, of our scenic designer is really... Um, Pretty great to have the, uh, the backdrop of the city and some of these effects that you simply can't achieve in an indoor environment um, uh, provide a really rich uh, experience. And again, if you get distracted for a moment and you're not paying attention to what Hamlet's saying, that's quite all right because there's a lot to take in. Uh, and that actually might be a moment of, of personal um, beauty because you might notice this flock of birds flying overhead at just that moment or the way the light is hitting the, the city windows. Or um, So we actually really embrace that there's a lot of variables that we can't control and while we're trying to tell a very clear story and honor the text, um, there's also so much opportunity for being actually in this uh, sphere of performance and, and uh, appreciating a lot more. Another thing that's kind of a phenomenon of this um, 
uh, type of theater is that there's very little um, separation between the actors and the audience. And so there's um, this kind of direct confrontation, which is both a curse and a blessing for the actors, because if they are totally with you, as they are in this demonstration, where um, Ophelia has just gone through kind of the worst breakup ever, um, the audience is really is really with her, and you can see the uh, empathy on their faces. Of course, the, uh, the alternative is that if they're not with you, <laughs> There's no hiding because they're right there. So it's a, it's pretty. It can be pretty powerful in in both of those ways, um, as an actor to be really unmasked in front of the audience and vice versa. I show this one because it also shows um, that in addition to choosing the right uh, play for the right. Uh, place, it's also the right scene for the right location. So that within the larger environment, you know, we're choosing um, where each thing is going to happen. So this is a, where Rogue and Peasant Slave happens. It's a speech uh, where um, Hamlet's feeling very confined and trapped. And so he's actually behind this fence and the audience is experiencing this text while having to kind of look through this chain linked fence. Um, and this photo is quite special also because uh, this is. Um, just a miracle of this particular performance, which probably never happened more than this one time, where the sun just created this natural spotlight on Hamlet. And those are some of the kind of sublime moments that we can't control, um, but uh, are such great gifts. Uh, and again, if we can kind of notice them in this kind of heightened, suspended reality of performance, perhaps it will make us a little bit more uh, aware and able to appreciate those moments of spontaneous beauty in our, in our daily lives. Um, I'm going to skim through these a little bit more quickly. Um, uh, we next went to Hyde Street Pier, which if you haven't been down there, brave your way through Fisherman's Wharf to get to Hyde Street Pier. Uh, it's right next to Ghirardelli Square. It's an amazing um, pier, uh, San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. And uh, they have a bunch of historic ships. So we did a sailing production aboard the Alma. So this is us sailing past our previous stage, sailing by Alcatraz on our current stage, which was a 60-foot scow schooner called Alma. Um, and we were able to um, have scenic uh, backdrops in this one, but painted on sail. So this is like a 10-foot eye painted on a sail to help us tell the story of the Cyclops uh, who's eating Barbies on deck. And again, you can see the kind of proximity of the actor-audience relationship. They're very close. And we also use distance. Again, so this is Hermes appearing up on the very top of the mast. Um, we actually also put the sirens on the shore so that we could literally sail by the sirens, which was kind of a, OK, are the sirens there? We're coming around the corner. <laughs> um, are they on the beach yet? Because it's a little unpredictable on a sailboat what's going to happen with the wind and whether it's going to be 3 o'clock or 3.30 that you sail by. Um, so there's a lot of variables. Um, we next went to Angel Island, uh, which is actually California State Park. This is Prince Telemachus waiting for the audience to arrive by ferry. Um, you arrive and you're immediately kind of dropped into Ithaca, where the suitors are raging and partying and getting the audience involved. And um, and again, you can see kind of distance. Um, great, I don't have very much time, so I'm going to just fly through and show you the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, just there's a couple I think in the future that I'd like to share, and all of these will will take too much time to tell. Um, this is worth mentioning just because, um, again, you have the stage that you're in, the island, but then we're also able to use uh, what surrounds the island. So Hermes appears on a speedboat while the audience is on, on the beach. And again, this is just a lot about trying to expand our perception, our way of recognizing our uh, immediate location and um, our relationship to that place. Um, I'm going to let Lauren speak a little bit and uh, skim ahead and see if there's uh, a, a few photos of the current production of Macbeth at Fort Point that we're doing that, that might be nice to share. So I'll do that while Lauren speaks. Okay, great. Um, yeah, feel free to show more pictures. So um, as Ava mentioned, after we did Macbeth at Fort Point for the first time in 2008, our production is actually up and running for another two weeks for those who want to come and check it out this time around. Um, but we received an invitation from the National Park Service to work out on Alcatraz. And as part of this very propitious invitation um, was also a request to integrate the site more fully and to actually provide, um, use our art to highlight park resources. And so while the fundamental practices of our site integrated theater had you know, been born out of this incredibly brilliant person and um, honed for many years, our organization was really born 
during our three years out on Alcatraz, where we were stretching what it meant to create site-integrated art. It was really great, Raquel, to hear you talk about, um, uh, to mention Carrie Leland Love, because she actually was one of our artists that worked, she was working with Writers' Corps at the time, and we also collaborated with Project What to host a youth symposium on justice and freedom out on Alcatraz. And we worked with a bunch of kids who, whose parents were incarcerated. We worked with a bunch of incarcerated artists. We um, had uh, programming that bridged the gap between historic and current. And so in our partnership with the Park Service, what they see we players bringing is uh, a very beautiful, aesthetically, oh, sorry, excuse me, aesthetically beautiful and um, creative, entry point for uh, accessing these universal human themes that are resonant in the specific histories of a site and are resonant in our time today. And so we can talk about things that government can't talk about because of the politics of one way or another, but when you use art, you can actually ask questions and provoke thought on Isolation, incarceration, justice. Um, when we were working on Angel Island, you know, these th huge questions around immigration and immigration policy and where people come from and go to. And you also mentioned um, contested. We had a visual art exhibit on Angel Island that was called Well Contested Sites because that island in particular has the longest military history of anywhere in the bay. It has the a quarantine station, immigration station. It was the um, like fishing and hunting grounds for the for the native coast Miwok, and it was and then it was uh, the first place that the Spanish ships actually found safe harbor from which to map the rest of the bay. So there's all these different layers of history, and what we're doing by making ephemeral theater art and really carefully placing site integrated visual art and musicians who are creating other sort of uh, landscapes with sound. What we're doing is um, writing history today and emphasizing that the stories that we're living are, are very relevant and our activities um, in these public places have a relationship to what has happened there in the past. I think, uh, to add on to what Lauren's saying, that um, something about ephemeral art that um, I believe is really powerful is that it can really live on in the hearts and minds and psyches of the people who experienced it for that moment. So um, the fact that its, it's birth is, is a death, it's a kind of release, um, but the people who were there share in something that is both uh, collective with the people that you were there with and the, and the audience, but it's also very personal. And one of my favorite pieces of feedback from our shows has really been people who come up and say, you know, that, that, that Alcatraz is now Denmark to them, or that these spaces have been transformed in their imaginations, and they'll never sort of be able to think of uh, the Albany Bulb in the same way, because it's now Prospero's uh, uh, home of the, of the Tempest, and they become these kind of enchanted realms. So besides that that's uh, flattering and nice, um, it's, uh, thank you. Um, I think the reason that that's actually important is because it helps us uh, be more aware of the many layered histories uh, that have happened and how they affect uh, how they affect us in all of the spaces that we inhabit, and that our, that what we're doing is adding a new layer of history in the moment. And if we kind of recognize that that spectrum, that we might become a, a little bit more interested in imagining the future of some of these spaces and get creative about how we might like to uh, envision envision these spaces going forward. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so hi, I'm Rebecca Novick, and thank you everybody, that was great. So interesting, I wrote down a lot of key words that I heard <laughs> from you guys, and I'll have some questions. So, uh, but Susan did ask me to say a little bit about, about the Triangle Lab, and, and it's so connected to, to everything you've heard. So I, I run a program that uh, has been around for about two years, 
uh, which is a joint project between Intersection for the Arts and, and the California Shakespeare Theater. And, and what, the, what the Triangle Lab is kind of about is being sort of a, a research and development wing of this large theater and this, um, uh, you know, nonprofit that's also a, a, a you know an arts organization and a social justice organization and the the triangle lab is all is all kind of about investigating uh, new kinds of performance ways to integrate artists more closely into communities ways that that theater artists can be involved in kind of understanding community needs helping solve community problems and and then also we're looking at how to make uh, performances more participatory in, in, in all kinds of places so uh, really connects to, to kind of everything I, I've just heard. And, and um, you know, one of the things that, that I think about a lot and kind of where the, where the kind of source of the name of the Triangle Lab is, is, is it, uh, for us this kind of triangle between arts institutions, individual artists, and then communities. And, and kind of, I'm particularly very interested in, in the question of how, you know, how can we better, as arts institutions, how can we better triangulate? Like how can we better do the job of bringing artists Together with community members, how can we leverage the the resources of the institution to to, to do that? And and I guess that makes me think a lot about place. And um, so in the blog post I wrote, one of the things I I didn't have a chance get a chance to sort of fit into that 500 word essay was was thinking about how you know all theater is really site specific, but I think I think a lot of times we we sort of try to you know we sort of expect our audience to to not notice the choices you're making inside a traditional site, you know, one of which is like that all the seats face the same way and don't move. And, you know, one of which is that it costs a lot of money to come there. And one of which is you can't get in late. And, you know, there are all these kind of constraints of a, of a traditional site. And, and, and I think, um, you know, I'm really interested in these kind of, we, we heard two kind of, uh, different terms for for site responsive and site integrated. And I, and, and I think that's something that strikes me as really exciting about, about these, this kind of work. And, and it also makes me think about, in what way our um, theaters and our arts institutions can be both responsive and integrated to the site in which they find themselves by virtue of their building or their partnerships or the community they're, they're trying to work with. So I guess that's what I want to start by, by asking you, you all and, um, is uh, how, do you, um, how do you hope to change the relationship of people and place Kind of in your work, is that is that something that you that you articulate as a goal? Um, uh, and it might be quite different for both of you. Yeah, I can start with that. Um, Ava mentioned how in the staging for these large scale traveling theater productions, activity is happening above you and below you and in the distance and at different scales. And we're happy if you notice the birds instead of what someone is saying in that moment. So as part of our mission statement where we want people to wake up to this amazing world. And referencing earlier, you know, like everyone's spending so much time on screens. We're so vision dominated these days that we really think what we're doing with, with having art integrated into places. So you have to look for it or work for it or move your body in order to follow it. Um, we think that those, that practice is helping people be more aware and use their full sensory apparatus. And so I guess relationship with place is like, well, not just the, the thought about a place or the ideas in a place or the, the, what you see in a place, but what do you hear, what do you smell, what do you taste, what does it feel like to you? We're trying to get people in touch with that relation, those relationships. I think that's, that's really great. I love that. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, is, I was really struck by your example of, of the youth with incarcerated parents and doing a workshop with them on Alcatraz. H how how do you feel like the location impacted that or what was your, what were you hoping to, to affect in that workshop by doing it at Alcatraz? Um, I guess I wanna answer that and, and tag on to it. Um, part of working with the National Park Service that we're really interested in is diversifying the demographic that goes to some of these places and making them more relevant to different people. So what we got a lot of when we were out on Alcatraz was that you know, they certainly have no problem getting plenty of people out there. They're sold out every day in the summer. There's five million people a year. It's second only to Disneyland in California. Um, so they don't have any issue with that, but they don't really have a lot of local people going out. And they certainly don't have a lot of young people going out. And 
amazingly enough, there's very little conversation about that incarceration is a major epidemic in our country, and we really focus on the Tommy guns and the Al Capone story. And 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 I don't, I, you know, there's a lot of really great interpretation that happens out there, but I think there's also a huge missed opportunity for conversation and interpretation that is hypercharged by its um, environment and by the unavoidableness that you are standing in a prison. And why aren't we talking about what it is to be in a prison? So um, I think that for us, you know, trying to get other people to come to some of these sites um, who might not otherwise go um, is, is both... Um, is also something that the parks have been really excited about because the only way that some of these parks are going to stay alive and uh, stay stay alive is if uh, is if they are um, if they are relevant and what we're doing with the theater and these different programs is trying to help people build a personal emotional connection with the site because we believe that sort of is the first step to becoming a site steward or becoming better site stewards of our public lands and of our park sites and that there's no reason to invest in the work and the fight to keep them awake if we don't care about them so we have to have events and programs in these places that make us care about them and lots of people have different points of access so some people are coming to Angel Island for the Odyssey because they're really interested in the environment and hiking and exploring the island. And some of them are like classical, the you know, classical uh, literature buffs and they're really interested in our interpretation of the Odyssey. So there's a lot of different entry points. Um, so for, the, for the, the projects that we did on Alcatraz that were specific to, you know, say youth, that um, uh, there were youth from Project What? Um, but there were also and youth from the local nature awareness homeschool community. So it was also providing us an opportunity to bring kids together and youth together who might not otherwise ever intersect and in this very charged, very loaded environment where you cannot escape the conversation because it's surrounding you. So that's why. Great, great. Raquel? Um, can I ask you to re-say the question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in, in your work, do you, do, you, do you have a goal or, or how do you look at uh, kind of shifting or understanding or, or investigating kind of people's relationship to the place, whether that's your building sure. or your neighborhood or their neighborhood? Um, well, you know, the community, types of community members that I'm reaching out to don't have a traditional relationship to, first of all, YB, YBCA, um, probably have a different relationship to the arts in general. Um, I think for what we're trying to do is um, contingent on this, on these just two um, principles around flexibility, uh, especially if we're asking people to partake in art making experiences and to take, you know, answer the phone when I call and, or, you know, send the text back when I text, but also, and this idea of a mutual mentorship in the sense that YBCA, we can, sure, we can bring the art, we can bring all kinds of high production values, um, we can bring artists with, you know, decorated with every single kind of, um, you know, certification, whatever, just kidding, art school. Um, but that the work and the collaboration isn't going to move forward unless we are able to meet people where they're at, you know, just this idea of like mixed, uh, mixed consciousness and, um, but also that people are living archives. People have seen the arc of their neighborhood change five years, 10 years, 15 years. And that, um, you know, people are, you know, also reminding myself and, and working with the artists and the scholars that I do work with that, you know, um, Community members, people in neighborhoods don't always think of the, they don't think of themselves as critical witnesses, but they are. You know, they're very critical of what's going on, the change of, of change, or they're very scared, or they have an opinion about what kind of attention their kid is getting at school. Um, and being sensitive to that, and uh, and also I think just our own commitment to con continuity um, and uh, consistency. Um, and that this is a life, you know, a, as much of a lifelong thing as it's going to be it, wherever you are at in terms of trying to build. Um, and knowing that a collaboration, it might have taken six, nine, 12 months, 24 months, but that we have to figure out ways to re-invite people to either be um, shepherds for other people that are having the experience for the first time um, but finding ways to continue nurturing and growing those relationships that took a long time to build. And you can't just 
let them go just because the funding's gone or whatever. And finding ways to re and invigorate, and also just know that um, I don't know. I just think about like how I grew up, and my mom and dad are from. Mexico and El Salvador, and they came to this country in the 70s and feeling like, how did they know, you know, you know, they went to school and brain drain, you know, couldn't, couldn't do the work that they were doing back in their countries here, but they still knew that going to the library was important, you know, and going to the museum was important, and um, feeling like they gave that opportunity to just be in a different place, you know, so feeling like now I'm at YBCA and it's just like, I don't know, I just, like, you ever feel like you're just Harriet Tubmaning some shit and, like, feeling like you're just, uh, um, anyway. <laughs> Trying to, like, just really make the space as open, uh, you know, open this house to people and making it somehow, imbuing them with a sense of, like, ownership over it and just, like, keep coming back, keep coming back. Um, yeah, 12 step. Um, so, anyway, all that to say. <laughs> <laughs> Say on that, that, that place-based work or whatever kind can both uh, be the thing that's just happening that you stumble upon, and that can be really powerful about connecting people who might not otherwise ever go to a theater or to the museum or to a library, that if you actually you know, put it in the middle of the campus or the middle of the city uh, or uh, that people stumble across it, and that can be really powerful, but it can also be this powerful way of getting people out to places they've never been before. Um, we've had youth from Oakland who've, uh, different parts of, of the Bay Area, who've actually never been to uh, the ocean, you know, and having uh, a show that's happening and that's really exciting and we're partnering with their school to bring them out there is getting them out to, uh, to connect with their own local landscape, with our own backyard. We live in one of the most beautiful places on the planet, you know, and sometimes we get so busy with all the important and wonderful, great things that we're up to that we forget to explore our own environment. So I think that, um, you know, it can be both something that, that we stumble across and, and that's really useful as kind of an entry an entry way to art, uh, and it can also be this thing that, that gets us out and motivates us to go explore uh, places that we might not otherwise. Great. So I'm going to ask these guys one more question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. So um, uh, you said something that I wrote down, Ava, that I loved. So you said seeing is an act of creation, and that that's kind of one of the ways you think about particip the participatory nature of your work. And then you, you were talking, Raquel, about, about the uh, kind of uh, the work being non-hierarchical and also being experiential. And, and so, you know, certainly we're all hearing a lot of this kind of buzzword around participatory arts and uh, um, how interested a lot of foundations are in that right now and, 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 and how interested I think a lot of artists are in, in creating participatory work. And can, um, can you guys talk a little bit more about uh, sort of how that value plays into your work and, and your decisions on how you, how you organize it? Because um, I want to start with you, Raquel, asking about the choice to make those collaborations be about, about making together as opposed to like uh, touring something to different neighborhoods. Um, one of, uh, I, I, in LA, I worked at a Cornerstone Theater Company, and uh, if you guys study applied theater, you guys maybe know what Cornerstone is, but um, it's a community collaboration uh, theater company that sets up shop in a particular community. It could be any kind of community. Um, also trying to explode this idea of what community is beyond the ethnic, religious, affinities, gender, location. Um, that it could be, you know, maybe a community of animal, animal rescuers. Anyway, um, so one of my favorite, um, just getting to know everybody type of exercise is the spectrum where you make a big smile or a big horseshoe and on one spectrum is uh, social justice and the other side of the spectrum is aesthetics and that everybody wants to be in the middle but there, we can't have any clumping so you have to find your space on the spectrum and you have to talk to different people to figure out like why did you choose that. The more conversations you have with the people along the spectrum, you get to, dis you get to discover about yourself just exactly what your relationship is to social justice and aesthetics. And sometimes people are super just very avowed around like aesthetics always or like social justice forever. Um, but I'm um, finding, you know, I think like where you, and I think this also comes into how we vet artists and finding the right artist who's gonna be able to interface with a diversity of people, most importantly, the an economic, an aptitude to, to interface with economic diversities. Um, so in terms of like how to, uh, how to put value, it almost, I mean, well, you know, I think it's it's the process, of course, that gets privileged in in this kind of collaborative project, um, and it's also where you're going to see the impact, I think, and like finding ways to document the impact 
Um, but also, you know, people don't have a, a traditional relationship to the arts by because of accessibility issues or the fact that there's no art education in a lot of curriculum. Um, that this might be, you know, the average person's first encounter with art making and art making opportunity, and they will either pass on it or invite somebody else to do it or also participate in a way that doesn't necessarily lead to them being on the stage or their work being on the wall or maybe it does depending on who knows we find the uh you know just the un unseen genius or whatever in the mix not that that, that, that that happens, but it's also an opportunity for an artist to, who is still the lead artist to make work with a, a different kind of collaborative experience. So it's a range. Um, you know, when I, when I was first uh, talking to um, my, the team that interviewed me at YBCA, you know, there was some visible cringing in the room about like, oh, you know, are we going to present this? Um, and you know, that was a little disheartening, um, but also it's real, that's real, that's real out there and nobody wants to be coerced into having to do this kind of programming in order to get this kind of funding. But, um, but also, you know, art heals and beauty heals and that shouldn't just be for those that know what it is. So, I don't know, it's complicated. <laughs> yep. And what about for you guys? Um, I guess like you were saying that on some level all performance is site specific because it's in a place and you're using that place and not another one. Um, in a similar way, it's like all art is participatory. You know, um, you have to engage with it to get anything from it. Um, you have to be there. Um, and, uh, and then I think that's really fundamental to the process too, right? Like the work of art is just that. It's work and it's a reflexive process. So as the maker is making the art, the art is making the maker. It's it's working on, on you um, as you're making it. So I think um, just kind of like deepening our, um, our our interest or our investigation of some of these terms um, is is really important to um, both understanding what we're doing and then ex from that expanding uh, what we're doing. It's like we can't really innovate if we don't have a relationship to where we're coming from. Um, it's not as it's not as informed kind of where we're where we're going. Um, I think there's an infinite number of responses to how to make participatory art, how to make site specific art. That's why it's so fun because it never gets boring. It never gets old. You can't possibly exhaust the the possibilities. Um, so um, and for me and then and then how each artist um, then answers that question is you know is very personal. Um, for me, uh, ironically, I am really hate being. Um, I'm sort of most drawn to the most traditional art forms, strangely enough, when I'm like making art that is about responding to tearing down the walls and removing the seats, and all I want to do is go to the symphony. So it's kind of like, you know, um, that's a way that I that I want to participate with art that then fuels my my process, which is about creating kind of really very different conditions. Um, but um, yeah, I really uh, appreciate what you just said, Raquel, about kind of those layers of participation, because as we're, you know, there's, there's so many different um, uh, needs to fill. And when we're working with youth, that's one of the great, great joys is figuring out who's, where does everybody shine? We all shine. And, and when we engage with the work of art, which is a process, it's this kind of, if we can stay in the place of discovery and curiosity and surprise and unfolding and, and artist practice being in the mess of things, right? And I think that's really useful, is to get comfortable being in the mess and, and not everything uh, being in control or organized. And when we can get more comfortable with that, I think we're a little bit more open to, to surprise, which allows us to kind of like discover where, where we each shine. So some kids are going to really shine when they're in the tech booth. And some people are going to really shine when they're on stage. And some people are going to really shine because they're, they're good at serving. And so they're good at being part of, the, of, of supporting a conversation. Um, so um, yeah, I think it's both very personal and very endless, which thank goodness for all of us, because it will just uh, keep unfolding. OK, great. So I want to turn it over to the audience now and see who has questions. No questions. Yes. Can you say your name first? My, yeah, my name is Lily Alexander. Um, so this is directed at Ava and Lauren. I was I, I understand that um, some of your performances are particularly directed at youth, but in general, um, I mean, with this idea of a more uh, mobile 
um, performative experience and participatory experience, how do you deal with issues of those who are, whose mobility is challenged? Because it seems that a lot of people might be left out of this experience, and I'm wondering, I mean, it's a very exciting idea, and yet how do you make it more open for people who can't? Yeah, I just want to quickly say, though, that, the, that they're not directed to youth, and Lauren will take it from there. <laughs> Yeah, um, what's unique about We Players is that our audience are avid theater goers, nature lovers, and families, really, because you don't have to sit in one place. So that's why kids are part of our audience, unlike other theaters. But in terms of your question with mobility and accessibility, um, we that's part of our process of being in the space and learning about the space beforehand. Um, a lot of the sites in which we work are, are not inherently accessible, historic buildings, Fort Point, in particular, is very inaccessible with all of the spiral stairs to the different levels. And trying to integrate the art, um, we're trying to make use of, of little nooks and crannies and spaces at all, in all different places. So um, one, of, one of my jobs, actually, is to figure out, OK, well, what is the accessible route? And something that we embrace is that uh, everyone is having a unique experience. We've talked about, like, Everyone's noticing something different because there's just so much going on, and we're supportive of that. And so um, at Fort Point, even though if someone, if there was someone with a boot the other night, or if someone's in a wheelchair, they aren't going to the other levels, but um, we have, we have actually have like a video of some of the scenes that's playing in a room, but it's actually in a room where we also have three different site integrated artworks. And when there's a banquet, we actually have like food tucked away off the side for them that their docent brings over. And so they get to enjoy the food and other aspects of the fort. So they get to do a little tour of some of the other interpretations and other aspects of the fort while they're maybe missing what a larger group of people are doing. And then in other places, it's like, OK, well, everyone goes up the stairs except those who need to take the elevator. Great. That's what we did at the Alcatraz cell house. So it's sort of figuring out. Um, and then, of course, there's all the choreography around that, around, OK, well, how do they move through the natural flow of people out of the cell house? And like, so there's different things to figure out, but it's all um, in, the, in the details. We're already embracing that everyone's seeing the show from a different vantage point. So sometimes those people who can't go up the stairs are seeing the same scene, but they're seeing it from a different vantage point, which is um, just a further iteration of what everybody's doing. Um, and then in a place like Angel Island, which is an 800-acre stage, and most of the audience walked five miles, there was a white chariot, AKA a van, that drove like in parallel so that people could could get around. So um, it is something that we, that we address. Um, and also why I kind of chimed in and said, no, it's not dedicated to, to kids, is actually because that's one of the things that we've found to be uh, a great success for us is that we have this huge age demographic coming, that we have people in their 80s, and we have eight-year-olds, and we have everybody in between, because there's so many different access points. And um, so. Uh, over there, yeah. Hello, hello. Good. Uh, question for we players. You mentioned that uh, just uh, following your actors around is kind of like a low level of participation in your shows. I'm wondering what the high level is, and uh, whether um, the agency of audience members is an important part of how you structure your work. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the most basic level. And then every show uh, presents different possibilities. So a great example, and I flew through the slides where I would have told you these stories, is that on Angel Island, you got to a crossroads and you met Zeus. And Zeus gave, gave you one of three options. And of course, like in life, you can only choose one. You can't choose all three, unless you come back three times. So um, you could either uh, take the uh, op Nike Missile Challenge, which was an obstacle course that was um, built on the uh, obsolete Cold War Nike missile launching site on Angel Island, um, which was the home of Scylla and Charybdis, two of the most fearsome, loathsome monsters known to mortals. And uh, you had to physically run. So you had to give your bags to someone you came with and sprint and run to the obstacle course. And if you weren't feeling like three hours into the show you wanted to go running, you could climb up a, a hill, which was a little bit less exertion, uh, to cheer on the hero of your choice from up above uh, with Zeus on his golden megaphone. Or if you're feeling like, it's hot, I'm tired, let's go to Temenos, the sacred island where beauties will sing to me and wash my hands. You could um, make the smart choice and go there. And, uh, and then you could take a very easy route uh, and walk or ride one of the little trams to go to the chapel where these women would 
bathe your hands in cold eucalyptus scented water and sing to you. And uh, so that's an example of more, you do have agency, you choose, you don't get to choose the other path, uh, and it does uh, inform your destiny. And, uh, and it was also positioned at this really critical moment in the play where you were tired and hot and cranky and hungry and exhausted, and we knew that. And so it was uh, very much intended to be this moment where you have to make a choice that is going to then color and affect the rest of your two hour experience thereafter. Um, so there's different examples per show, but I think that kind of that one sort of sums it up. One thing that's nice about that too is then you get a kind of cross pollination of audience experience that you don't often get because people talk to each other and say, "Which way did you go? What was that like?" Uh, and you also get that when we're walking because we're walking or traveling. Um, and so sometimes if you don't get what's going on in the story, we're like, "Why? What was that like thirty foot eucalyptus tree like with that shaved point covered in red all about?" And somebody else is like, "Oh, that was what Odysseus used to, to stab the Cyclops' eye out." So people are talking to each other during the show, which you usually don't get. Everyone's very respectful and quiet and waits till after the show, and then usually just talks to the people they came with. Um, so that's another, another way that choice gets involved and, and, uh, and communication gets involved. Hi, this is for Raquel. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in art that's made by uh, folks in the community that aren't necessarily used to making art in that sort of way. Like they may have um, cultural traditions that they do in sort of a more like private or home-based way. Um, but what you're proposing is actually sort of a, a broader um, community making. And I wonder if you could just describe one of your examples of what it looks like for your artists working in SOMA or the Excelsior or whatever. Sure. Um, well, the way that, I, that, you know, beginning a community partnership, um, it's mostly so one the one project in the mission is uh, that I uh, briefly touched upon with Ella uh, for trans Latinas. Um, I got off the uh, 16th Street Bard exit and there was a uh, an, ac an action uh, uh, in Spanish they call it manifestations manifestaciones um, where they were trying to bring attention to all the uh, um, violence that was affecting the trans Latina community. Um, there was a series of different um, violent encounters that happened in, that, in, in the mission. Um, and so I had run into a couple of people I knew who, uh, Marcio Ochoa, who's a professor at, at UC Santa Cruz, who volunteers as the director of this organization, um, and uh, Issa Noyola, who works as a program director at Lyric, um, who's on the board. And uh, we went out to lunch, and I talked to them about, uh, oh, you know, would you be interested in possibly being one of the projects on this uh, pro on this program I'm managing? Uh, this idea of installing two artists that would work with the uh, the members of Ella, pre predominantly the um, Trans Latina um, group that meets pretty much daily because it's one of, it's a safe space in a mission that people can go to get to and be respected for their gender presentation, um, not have to deal with any sort of issues around uh, immigration status, um, and get uh, certain health services um, and other sort of human service uh, com components. Um, so finding the, two, finding the two artists based on just what their own artistic output is, what their uh, interest around gender and, and performativity um, and also around like, you know, doing anti-violence work in, the, in their own artwork and feeling like placing these two artists, uh, Sandra and Dave End, in conversation with the members of the Ella community, the, uh, the way that they're, they're coming to decide on what their art project is going to be is through a series of conversations. And uh, they're meeting um, next Tuesday. They're going to meet the following second Tuesday. They're going to do the second Tuesday of each month through January to have a series of conversations around skill sharing, but also um, looking at Ella, the, the office space, um, as a possible art project. How to make this art? How to make this office space more welcoming, more reflective of the needs and interests of the of the of the population that gets services there. Um, how to make a more substantial alter to people you know, in their community that have passed on. Um, so feeling like the work that the artists are doing in conversation with the community members to create an office space that is a little more glamorous, a little more um, vibrant, uh, a little more flamboyant, um, 
and knowing that we have the resources to make that happen, knowing that that, art pro that, that office space is the art project, if that's what ends up happening. Um, the office right now is just kind of a glum, you know, uh, just found thrift store. Uh, it's, it's not the most creative space, so feeling like uh, a way f for the artists and for the community to make the space that much more livable is the project. Or maybe they want to do a nail salon installation based on these conversations. I don't know, but we're not, the thing is, we don't know what these projects and products are going to be because they're centered on the conversation between the artist and the community member, but knowing that that is also a possibility. They could also do, they might want to do a beauty pageant, who knows? Um, but just uh, that, that these are possibilities that have been made um, open. We're not trying to foreclose any possibility in these conversations with, uh, with community members. So that's one example. Um, another example is, uh, so Carrie Leelam Love, again, wanting to partner with Project What, wanting to project up, uh, partner with uh, Just Cause around housing issues, um, again, trying to place at the center of this collaboration uh, young voices, uh, young, young men and women, sons and daughters of one or both parents that are have been or are currently incarcerated and um, feeling like we could do a block party. We could do a block party and um, somewhere in the course of this block party we will have either, and Carrie talks about doing installations, you know, trying to find actual found objects or create work, create a, a, a sculpture or some sort of um, three-dimensional, you know, creating some sort of space that is a culmination of the conversations and collaboration with these young people and, and their families. So um, that's the thing. Like, I don't know what, what the projects are going to be, what the products are going to be, uh, because it we have to just privilege that the you know, community, when, when they're there, when they show up, um, will work with the artists to produce, to create, to, you know, um, project uh, the findings of their back and forth. So it's very Socratic. I don't know if that satisfies you. <laughs> okay. okay, great. So I think we have time for one, one more question. Yeah. Um, my name is Alejandro. I, I work for Intersection for the Arts. Um, and I, I kind of have a weird rambling question possibly for, um, for Raquel. Um, I've worked a lot uh, in the same neighborhoods that you do, and uh, thinking back to your uh, your what you were reading from, and you were talking about sort of the gentrification um, of Silver Lake mm -hmm. and uh, of the mission here in San Francisco as well, and uh, I'm thinking about past um, sort of art movements that specifically in the mission, so Presida Eyes Muralist and Susan Cervantes and the work that they did there and how it really, I think, did a lot to uh, both beautify the mission. Um, it did a lot, it wasn't being called this, but in terms of placemaking that you can walk down alleys like Lucky Alley and, and Clarion. And, um, and so in working with um, the groups that you do in the SOMA and in the TL, in the Community Benefit District, um, what, how do you navigate that, uh, what I perceive to be a, pr a very real tension between um, like improving a neighborhood for the residents and improving it for someone else to come in? Um, and just like, as a, as a arts practitioner in those neighborhoods, like I just, I just would love to hear you talk about um, what's that, what that's like. Yeah, of course. Um, it's, uh, you know, it feels very Sisyphean, um, uh, that just burden, you know, it's, uh, it's the burden, it's the curse, it's the gift, it's the blessing, um, uh, but um, feeling like, you know, even as, even as an artist, even as some sort of, uh, you know, the, the issue around gentrification or... Um, displacing another person so you can live there or finding ways 
or being a part, you know, it's, um, it's, circ it feels circular. It feels, uh, like there is, um, no, almost no resolve, you know, um, It's, it's in, I mean, the thing is, like, you know, change is, change is going to happen. Change is inevitable. Um, I feel like finding strategies to anticipate and encounter that change in a way that's going to turn you into some sort of, um, you know, the, the goal is to find some sort of symbiotic relationship, of course. But I think, like, in the work that we do, it's figuring out how to be a radical parasite. <laughs> you know, how to, how to have a way to... Um, benefit from this change that is happening, but benefit by way of maybe, I don't know, it's just like, do, do iPads, you know, at Bessie Carmichael, is that going to like solve a, solve a problem, you know, or, but that's where the, that's what a type of resource, right? And a way to counter it. It's com I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's complicated. I, um, I don't have an answer to that. I feel like, um, just, finding finding the wood to build the table to invite the people to sit at it you know and to like keep people at it is like just the work that I do um cajoling people to stay at the table you know to you, I, this is this is why I'm so mad at those undergrads that were here for the free food is because our conversation you know they were kind of you know they they were visibly very like um they were bristling at a lot of the stuff happening around like issues, you know, community and gentrification and development. But for, you know, what, who does that get to, you know, who benefits from all of that? And the idea, and I, and I, things that I've heard, you know, for the last 15 years, and it's just like, you know, but we have to stay in these rooms. We can't not leave the room because if we leave the room, um, people of lesser conscience will take our, assume our places and then no one will ever be here to advocate or to argue for or to like go to bat um, for the people that don't have a voice. But even then, um, I don't know, it's, uh, it can be dispiriting, it can be disheartening. Um, but then there are those moments where, those few fleeting moments where the work that you do does find its place, you know, with, with, with a family, with a child, with a, with a, with an elder, um, how to, how to make peace with that. I don't know. It's hard. It's a, these are very complicated times and it's more pronounced here because the space is so already been, uh, doled out in a way that we'll never know all the full details back, back alley. I mean, they should, I don't know, David Simon should develop the gentrification wire of San Francisco. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that wraps up our time. So thank you, you guys, very much. Thank you, everybody.